Hello and welcome to Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen, here with another story about historically significant people, places, and events from Connecticut's long and fabled past. Today on Amazing Tales, The Grange. It's been with us since the 1800s, but in Connecticut and elsewhere, it's facing a huge challenge for its very survival. But this group, which you'll see is not just for farmers, has a few tricks up its sleeve. And it's got an incredible history and a great purpose, both worth preserving. My guests are going to be Jody Cameron, former head of the Grange Organization in Connecticut and currently its treasurer, Terry Fazio, head of communications for the State Grange, Elizabeth Jensen, the new head of the Grange in Reading, Connecticut, and Neil Olshansky, an officer of the Grange in Bridgewater. Now stay tuned for Keeping the Grange Alive in the 21st Century. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb and bet that you don't know much about the Grange. If you're like me, you might think the Grange is the place where farmers meet, at least the dwindling number of them who are left, to keep alive their way of life. Usually they meet in a worn-down old barn or some other 19th century structure, right? Well, the old structure part can be right on occasion, but for the rest, the primary emphasis on agriculture changed a long time ago. To truly understand the Grange, though, you have to look back to its creation in 1867, and you can thank a man named Oliver Kelly. Kelly was, as you probably guessed, a farmer. He farmed in Minnesota, but he wasn't always a farmer. He had been raised in Boston. In 1849, he made the choice to move to Minnesota and become a farmer. Now, at that time, 170 years ago, Business in the St. Paul, Minnesota region was dominated by trading with Native Americans. But Kelly saw something else. He saw wide open space, and he saw opportunity from agriculture. Well, it turns out he was quite a farmer, innovative and progressive. He experimented with new crops and invested in the latest technology. Within 10 years, he was writing a newspaper column about his newfangled activities and ideas, and that made him quite well known. In fact, officials in Washington, D.C. took notice. He was invited to take a prestigious job at the new United States Agriculture Department, yes, the USDA, which had just been formed in 1862. Now, of course, that was during the Civil War. Well, Kelly went ahead and moved to D.C., and soon as the brutal Civil War ended, he toured some farms in the South. He already knew the West where he lived. And he listened. What he heard was farmers facing many similar issues. The tracks for the new railroad system across the U.S. usually cross their land. Well, the railroad tycoons and the bankers seem to be in cahoots with the government, using eminent domain to take their land without sufficient compensation. Even worse, once the railroads were in... Farmers were being charged exorbitant fees to carry their milk and grain to markets. And if their crops were bad for a season or two and they couldn't make their mortgage payments, those same bankers that were financing the railroads would take their farms. Terry Fazio is head of communications for the Connecticut State Grange Organization. He thought an organization where he could bring all these people together would be a good thing. She says that Kelly went back to Washington and pulled together some agriculture department colleagues who shared his vision. They were from uh, all different areas of the country and decided that, you know, this is a, a good thing that we should pull together and, and do it. They officially formed the Order of the Patrons of Husbandry. They simplified the name to just the Grange, an English word that means farm. Incidentally, husbandry has nothing to do with marriage. It means being able to milk a cow or raise cattle. Well, it turns out the Grange became a juggernaut of an organization. It soon was a very potent political group. With its considerable voting membership, it could lobby lawmakers very effectively and move the needle on legislative changes. Their formula was a simple one. The best ideas rise to the surface. If a local Grange saw a need for a new law to protect farmers' rights, they'd vote on it and send it up to the regional Grange organization. Well, if you got enough support there, it would move on to the state level. And eventually, a really potent idea could rise all the way to the national level, where it could get the lobbying muscle it needed before Congress. 
The early so-called Granger laws set regulatory limits on the amount railroad companies could charge farmers to store and transport their products. And with that immediate need met, the Grange began to focus on other local community needs. For example, you might not know that the Grange was the key organization that kick-started the 4-H Club and the Future Farmers of America. Both of those organizations remain with us to this day. One such need, says Terry, was mail delivery. They were kind of forgotten. You know, mail was running around in, in cities and urban areas uh, without a lot of delay. But if you mailed something to somebody who was in a rural area, you, you know, it took a long time to get there. Mail delivery was nothing short of the communication lifeline to the rest of the country in those days. Communities, uh, if they don't have enough uh, to support their little post office, the post office goes away. So now they have to drive a half an hour or 40 minutes to get their mail if they don't have uh, a rural delivery route. That's an issue that the Grange still battles to this day, as cost cutting in the post office threatens those rural areas. The Grange is also battling for a newer type of communications lifeline. Today, they're advocating for broadband in rural areas because a lot of the rural areas don't have a good internet connection, if they have an internet connection at all. Jody Cameron is a former head of the statewide Connecticut Grange organization, and he currently serves as its treasurer. Jody says that it's this emphasis on local community needs that may be the most misunderstood part of the Grange. He says a lot of people still equate the Grange with farming, and for good reason. And at the time that the Grange was organized, the preservation of free trade and agriculture was in the best interest of the community. Jody says the Grange has three core values, and they still hold as true today as they always have. The first one is called, in essentials, unity. It means if something's essential for a community, well, the residents ought to come together and unite around it. Number two, in non-essentials, liberty. So for those things that are not essential, pastimes, for example, that are more personal in nature, well, you should give people the liberty and freedom to pursue them as you'd like. And the final value, in all things, charity. That is, we should always aim to be kind and caring people. And when you zoom in on Connecticut, the Grange has played a critical role in several areas. Neil Oshansky is one of the officers of the Bridgewater Grange. He says that granges around the country historically had a very close relationship with the early agricultural schools in each state, which were facilitated by land grants. Every state was given a grant by the federal government to form a university. And UConn was Connecticut's. Terry Fazio picks up the Yukon story. Before there was a Yukon, there was the Storrs Agricultural School, which was a struggling school back in the late 1800s. It was called the Land Grant College. The fledgling college didn't even have enough students enrolled in it to keep it afloat. The Grange stepped in and really supported, you know, Grangers would send their, their kids there for schooling. Um, and it basically saved the system and eventually the college became UConn. In fact, Terry says the head of UConn acknowledged this 70 years ago. President Georgensen um, actually spoke at the State Grange Convention in, in the 1950s and praised the Grange for uh, saving UConn because there wouldn't be a UConn today if, there, if it wasn't for what the Grange did back in its early days. There's even a dorm on the UConn campus in stores named Grange Hall. And yes, the Grange raised the money to build it. Of course, there's always the what have you done for me lately consideration. UConn today tends to forget about a lot of its uh, early, early roots. <laughs> it's now a basketball school where it's not, you know, the agricultural, there's an agricultural school that's part of UConn, but it's not as prominent as it, it once was, sadly. And yet there are still 5,500 active farms in Connecticut today. Now, to put that in some context, just 40 years ago in 1980, the number of farms had dropped all the way down to just 3,800. Well, we've seen a resurgence since then, with 1,700 new farms added, which is a 45% increase. Seems both tobacco in the luscious Connecticut River Valley and medical marijuana are crops that are doing quite well financially. Terry says that dairy farming alone continues to be a major economic contributor. The state of Connecticut measures uh, the production, um, particularly the milk production in 
the you know close to three three digit millions of, of income raised a year. And Terry says it wasn't just Yukon that got a critical helping hand from the Connecticut Grange. The Connecticut Department of Agriculture, they were going to get rid of that. And through the, the different lobbying work of the state grange and, and of the community granges, they saved the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. So that's one of the things they've done legislatively through the years. One interesting footnote in Grange history in Connecticut is what you might call the false start era. When the National Grange was started back in 1867, they formed 20 local granges in Connecticut. Well, nearly a decade later, Connecticut decided it was time to form a formal organization to manage them. There were two formations of the Connecticut State Grange. The first formation was April 15, 1875, and it was formed in Danbury at the Taylor Opera House. Well, the effort ultimately did not succeed due to financial and organizational issues. But Terry says some organizers didn't want to give up the fights. There were uh, some very strong people who suggested that, hey, let's give this a shot again. Um, And they organized 16 granges. Um, Some were from the original 20 and some were not. That second effort was headquartered in South Glastonbury, Connecticut. And it's where the official grange records say Connecticut's organization was founded. One interesting story dates back to the 1940s and World War II. The government sponsored fundraisers around the country to get the money to build warplanes. They called it the Buy a Bomber Drive. If your organization raised $300,000 by selling war bonds, which was a huge amount 80 years ago, a Flying Fortress airplane would be named after your organization. Well, the Connecticut Grange got busy and they raised $475,000 and the War Department gladly named one of its flying fortresses Connecticut Granger. All the Grangers in the state participated in a a drive to buy a flying fortress, which is a Boeing B-7 or a B-series plane. Other local Grangers in Connecticut have made multiple contributions over the years. Just to name a few, Granby is a leader in blood drives in the state. Glastonbury built a swimming pool and then turned it over to the town. Hundreds of thousands of dollars was raised in the 1950s for the polio vaccine. In fact, the Salk Institute in California has a room dedicated to the Grange. The Titanic Group supports its volunteer fire department in Sharon, and they are also lobbying for broadband cell towers. During the COVID pandemic, Jody says that the Fairfield Grange chipped in to meet a community need of togetherness, even when the call was for separation. They projected movies off of their building, and they did a drive-in for for people to go and watch movies on a Saturday night. Sit in your own car and sit there like the old-fashioned drive-ins. Well, you might think the lack of farming in Fairfield County would have rendered the Grange obsolete a long time ago. There are actually still four active Grange halls in the county, Fairfield, Reading, Wilton, and Monroe. Well, despite their altruistic values and many contributions, the modern-day Grange organization is struggling for its very survival. Membership numbers around Connecticut and the rest of the country are dropping. There are 169 towns and cities in Connecticut, and there used to be more than 200 Grange halls, more than one per municipality. Well, today that number has shrunk to just around 30. There are 3,500 active members, or roughly on average, 100 members per Grange Hall. As Jody notes, one issue is pure age, older members not being replaced by younger members. And at the Bridgewater Grange, Neil Olshansky says that's a very real phenomenon for them. Our membership is aging, which is, you know, it's, which is a problem. We have, I believe we still have one member who's, if not 100, very close to it who actually went to school in the Grange building when it was a schoolhouse. Neil says this member arrived each day at the schoolhouse in a horse-drawn cart, which he tied up outside while he attended classes inside. More importantly, an active recruitment drive is showing success in Bridgewater by drawing in younger members who want to keep the operation going. Jody says this trend, though, is not unique to the Grange. I think if you look at most of your fraternal organizations, uh, look at churches, right? I mean, they're all going through this evolutionary change. 
Another one of the Grange's big problems comes from within. It's a very traditional group with very formal and traditional ceremonies, borrowed in fact from the ancient Masons organization. They also still use official titles such as Master and Overseer. Many observers, and in fact many Grange members themselves, feel that these have outlived their usefulness and make the organization seem somewhat antiquated. However, older, longtime Grange members tend to take a different view. They grew up in the Grange, and they have been members for decades. They love these traditions, and often their parents and their parents did too. It's been sort of a family tradition over the past 150 years. Some old habits die hard, and so it is with some Grange traditions. In Connecticut, when you examine the current situation, you see something that's teetering a little bit on the precipice. On the one hand, the figures are clear, with membership in Grange Hall numbers declining. But a number of the remaining Grangers are actually doing quite well. Jody says one reason is that members are realizing that in order to stay relevant, they have to keep up with the times. He points to the very successful turnaround in Simsbury as an example. That group was on the verge of shutting down and handing in their charter. Instead, some new people got involved and got the Grange active in areas of true community need. Outdoor concerts, green recycling days, and educational programs for farms and nature in general. Well, it wasn't easy given Simsbury's unique makeup. It's a combination rural, suburban, urban bedroom community of Hartford. It was a rocky start, right? Because you had the traditional Grange members who were like, oh, you're ruining our Grange, you're ruining our Grange. Unfortunately, many of them have passed, but fortunately, many of them have passed. One very fresh turnaround story is the Grange in Reading. It was one of the Granges dating back to the official start of the Connecticut Grange organization in 1875. But its existence has been anything but continuous. Like many other Granges, the Reading Grange has seen periods of great success and periods of lagging enthusiasm. When this happens, a Grange is said to have to reorganize. On occasion, a Grange with insufficient membership and funds will surrender its charter to the state organization. And if a new group doesn't form to reignite the group, well, even the Grange Hall itself could be sold off and cast to the dustbin of history. Terry says that Reading had to admit that its Grange was running into a brick wall, which, considering their lengthy trail of good deeds, was certainly a sad turn of events. They were very active uh, in community service work. They've done things such as working with the Connecticut foster care system. They've worked with the American School for the Deaf. They do food collections that benefit like Dorothy Day House or Helping Hands. In the early 1900s, they had a theater troupe. For Reading, the 2021 reorganization was not its first. But it did seem like it may have marked the end, coming as it did in the midst of the COVID pandemic and in a 21st century where, frankly, there are many other things for people to choose to do and get involved with. Well, Elizabeth Jensen, for one, wasn't going to take that as a final answer. The Reading resident says that she would frequently drive past the 150-year-old Grange Hall on Newtown Turnpike. She says she simply loved the building. I get notifications about things that go up for sale in Reading. It's, an, it's like one of those alerts I set up, I don't know, 90 million years ago. And so one morning I go in my in- email and I see a picture of the Grange and it says for sale. I'm like, what? Elizabeth says she wasn't really sure what to do, so she picked up the phone and called the listing agent and she said, I don't even know why I'm calling you. I don't have any money. <laughs> Literally, I said that to him. And I said, I just feel compelled to like what is the story with this thing elizabeth calls it a true goodwill gesture that the agent put her in touch with the seller the state grange what began next for her was a journey along the way the issues elizabeth has found herself confronting are the same ones facing all the granges in the 21st century and what did she know about the grange when she started this journey not a lick Her first thought was that the Grange would make a great place for business people in Reading to meet. I can tell you right now, you try and find a place that's got um, Wi-Fi in Reading that's just 
publicly available for hanging out at. Good luck with that. And she was envisioning a pet-friendly location, particularly during emergencies. Very often people won't leave their house if they don't have power or something, if they can't take their pet with them. Well, as she started to peel back the onion and learn about the inner workings of the Grange, she could see that there might be a few hurdles to overcome, but yet some light at the end of the tunnel as well. You know, some of the pomp and circumstance around it, you still see some of that um, baked into the cake. But, you know, you go on their Instagram and they were posting for Juneteenth. What Elizabeth found was an organization in the process of redefining itself. What I see them doing is how do they take what has served them through time leave behind the pieces that don't necessarily serve them any longer and keep the pieces that do. And on the issue of it being just an agricultural organization? You can see the language that they use now is agricultural awareness. So I think they've really opened up the aperture of what they mean by connection to agriculture. This opens up possibilities for the Grange to help with beehives in your backyard or a native plant garden. But Elizabeth says the Grange tradition really has a lot going for it. The thing that's been so encouraging about looking at the Grange is knowing we're talking about an organization from the 1860s, knowing that they try very hard to maintain their identity um, and the spirit of their history, but watching how they really are trying to evolve to meet the needs of, you know, this day and age without selling out. Her goal then was to find that viable middle ground. There probably are going to be some things that we're going to want to do different. I don't want to go rogue. (laughs) I don't want to, you know, be a crazy Grange outlier, but I do want to see if we can find a model that's really successful. Okay, in true confession, all of Elizabeth's comments up until now were from August of 2021 before she got fully immersed in her Don Quixote-style effort to save the Reading Grange. Now, she's the Grand Master. That's right. She was successful in reorganizing Reading's Grange. I spoke with her more recently, and she now has enthusiastic members, some events in the pipeline, and objectives and goals. She sees the group continuing to foster agricultural and conservation needs in town. She also sees the need for an emergency relief fund of sorts to help the town win emergency strike. And finally, she wants to promote fun activities for what she calls the Grange at Play. Comedy nights and plays or movie nights and things like that. Things that really just bring the community together. And in an interesting twist, she had to go through one of those old-fashioned traditional ceremonies. The charter, the license to operate any Grange, was returned to Reading at a welcoming ceremony. The date on it was 1906, which was one of the times that Reading had um, reorganized. It's exciting that it hangs on the on the wall in our hall now, back where it belongs and, and had been. One great new idea is the Virtual Farmers Co-op. Reading's a two-acre zoning town with lots of land for every homeowner. Many of them grow vegetables and have excess after the harvest. Many people simply place that excess at the end of their driveway for passerbys to get. Elizabeth says the idea is to complete the farm-to-table loop. We all go to Stop and Shop and buy it because when you need eggs, you don't know where they are. You're not going to drive around town, right? So one of the ideas that we had is start with our farmers, find out what do they want to be in business with because it's their bread and butter, right? And then map out who's got the garlic and who's got the apples and who's got who's growing potatoes. The virtual co-op would list what's available around town, let residents place an order online, and then have the growers drop off the orders at the Grange Hall for pickup. Well, back up to Bridgewater, the Grange is well established in that community. The very popular Bridgewater Country Fair was started in 1954. But several decades before that, the Bridgewater Grange sponsored the agricultural fair that was the precursor for today's fair. Bridgewater's grain has both longevity as well as a close connection with the community. They draw from not only Bridgewater, but also Southbury, Washington, Roxbury, and New Milford. Neil Olshansky says people belong for a variety of reasons. Some are involved in agriculture, others own horse farms, some are interested in land use issues, 
and some just want a social organization to meet others, or on occasion simply because it's in their blood. Some were members of Granges in places where they lived as kids, and then when they came here they found the Grange even if they weren't involved in agriculture here. Their families might have been where they came from. The membership issue in the tiny but affluent town of Bridgewater brings farmers of different financial stripes. Some farms remain working farms, while Neil says some have been bought up by wealthy individuals who don't really need to farm. Some are, shall we say, gentlemen's farms, where financial survival is not reliant on the farm's output. <laughs> Others, the farmer is absolutely and completely, you know, his survival is wedded to his output. Neil sees a strong growth driver in the future being sustainable land use policies to help fight climate change. And with area high schools promoting an agricultural STEM curriculum, he says the Grange is perfectly positioned to help with that, including by doling out scholarships. They also feature a highly popular community chili cook-off. Neil says it's events like these that help the Grange mesh with the community. That's how the community connects to, to us. Roast beef dinners, chili cook-offs. It's vital that the community understand that this group is here and that we do things for the community. We do a lot of things that are not. I, I'm Santa Claus, for example. I've just started my beard for this season. He calls that a major event for Bridgewater. We serve cookies and cocoa and, and, and really connect to the community. And, and our goal is, is not to save the land but be a divorced from the community. Our, our goal is to be an integral part of the community that fights for the, the causes that are important to the community. Both Bridgewater and Reading work with multiple local groups, assessing their needs and then working in partnership to meet those needs. That, says Jody Cameron, is a winning formula. Don't tell your town what they want. Ask your people. Understand what, what's needed in your town and work together with other organizations, other citizens, and make your town better. So where does the Connecticut Grange organization go from here? In the several months it took me to research and compile this episode, Reading successfully reorganized, but Meriden had to turn in their charter. As often happens, though, Terry says that can bring benefits. When a smaller grange is fold, those active members from that smaller grange uh, will go to another grange that's, that's close to them, which will then help that other grange become stronger. And Elizabeth Jensen says that the recent Connecticut grange closure actually helped Reading. We inherited chairs that they had, and so we did a little chair naming fundraiser where you could put your name on the back of a Grange chair. At $125 a pop, it helped them raise some necessary money to pay the heating bill. And that's actually one of the steepest costs of running any Grange in New England. But longer term, Grange officials themselves openly say that to survive, there has to be flexibility and some changes. In Bridgewater, Neil Olshansky says the writing is on the wall. Well, I think that it's incumbent on the Granges to essentially rebrand themselves. Jody Cameron would agree. If you don't keep up with the times, regardless of what you are, a business, an organization, a family, you're going to, to become extinct. Jody goes on to say that the Grange is also battling the foe of modern times and modern technology, social media, online gaming, virtual reality, two-parent working households, and more activities than ever before from which to choose. The technology age has enabled you to include people from all over the world into your own personal community. But he questions whether those artificial communities can do much to help the real community needs on Main Street. Terry Fazio says that the old-fashioned practices definitely need some attention. The Grange used to be considered a secret organization because you had to have a secret handshake and a word to get in, and, and you had these ritualistic degrees. And it, it, if you think of the time period, that was very common back then. Today, not so much. For example, she says there's active discussion of changing the titles of master and overseer to simply president and vice president. And for Elizabeth in Reading, she has come to her own peace with some of the ritualism. She says that she can see that the time-honored traditions are a value that may not be so apparent to those not exposed to the inner workings of the Grange. If you think about what it is that they've been trying to hand down through time, 
and how do you protect it as the years and the generations go through and keep it intact as that thing part of that is why those archaic pieces need to stand she says it's like learning to speak a language that will become extinct if you don't learn it and speak it and pass it on to the next generation and then she says you're just another nonprofit. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. I want to very much thank my guests for this episode, Jody Cameron, former head of the Grange Organization in Connecticut and its current treasurer, Terry Fazio, the current communications leader for the state Grange, Elizabeth Jensen, the woman who's just spearheaded the turnaround of the Grange in Reading, and Neil Olshansky, an officer of the Bridgewater Grange. Please follow me on my main podcast website, amazingtalecct.podbean.com. Also, in between episodes, you can check out my Facebook page at Amazing Tales CT. Plus, I'd love hearing from you, and you can send me an idea of a story you'd like me to look into. If you liked what you heard, spread the word with your family and friends. See you next time here on Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC.